Okay, everyone, it's now quarter past, so we'll get started. I would like to introduce uh, Dan Gibbs, who is chairing this event today, um, and he is the Chief Operating Officer of Buckinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust, um, and also the exec sponsor of their LGBT plus staff network. Thanks, Tommy. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Uh, as Tommy said, um, there is uh, we've got some great presentations this afternoon and um, a big opportunity uh, for some um, questions um, at the end. Also, uh, you'll, you'll see in front of you the link to the Slido poll, www.sli.do, uh, and the code is A900. Please um, log on to them, post any questions that you've got. Um, Tommy will be moderating throughout. Um, uh, in just a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll hand over to our, our first speaker and they'll they'll introduce themselves as they go along and um, Tommy asked me to tell you a little bit about my role and and what what I'm uh, committed to doing at Buckinghamshire Healthcare my 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 uh, main role is as the chief operating officer I'm a member of the trust board essentially responsible for running the business on behalf of the board but I, I'm also the exec sponsor for our LGBTQIA plus network uh, which is um, a role I, I volunteer for and really I see my responsibilities um, in, in a couple of different ways. The first is um, really to support our network as it grows and develops and I think we, we're particularly excited to hear about the experiences of um, some others who may be um, a little further on in the journey to help us um, uh, kind of create our vision and, and how we want to move forwards. So really, you know, part one of the job is to, to help to help the network figure that out and also to figure out how to get things done uh, within the organisation. The second main bit of the role um, is also to um, be uh, be a member of the trust board who is there um, uh, representing the voice of um, LGBTQIA plus uh, staff, patients and, and people from the communities um, that we serve. And I, I also have a third element as well, which is really um, around influencing our culture. And much of the evidence points um, to positive cultural change, um, starting with um, us as um, uh, the, the, the leaders of the organisation, although really, um, it has to happen um, uh, across uh, every every person that's a member of the organisation. But I, I see it as my my responsibility to drive that, to make, and this is my pledge, my rainbow badge pledge, um, to make the organisation uh, an inclusive place uh, to work and be treated um, for LGBTQIA plus um, staff members and patients, um, uh, and also a place where they can feel free to choose to be their authentic cells um but I, I i won't um i won't bother you any more uh, with that stuff um and really um i hope you enjoy this afternoon a big shout out to tommy nick christine and others who've been involved in pulling it together fantastic piece of work um uh, we'll um get stuck in now tommy over to you okay so i'm going to introduce our first speakers uh, so we've got jenny uh, and Mark and Richard from Thames Water. Hello everyone, so um, my name is Jenny Jones and I'm the chair of our LGBT plus and allies network here at Thames Water uh, and my pronouns are she and they. Um, so I'm really excited to be joining you today to talk about our LGBT plus and allies network. Um, so there are a couple of us joining as, as um, Tommy's mentioned, so I thought I'd start with a couple of introductions. So if we can go to the first slide please. Um, so, as I mentioned, I'm the chair of our network and joining me today from Thames Water is Mark Deller, our deputy chair, and Richard Holt, our senior sponsor. So all three of us are here to answer your questions. Please do put them in the chat for us so we can get to them. Um, and I wanted to start off by giving you a bit of an overview of our network, what we do, what we've achieved so far. So we really exist, um, similar to what Dan was saying, to kind of enable people to be themselves and perform better. Uh, we want Thames to be a place where everyone is accepted for who they are. So that's really embedded in all of the work that we do. And to, to measure our success on that, we have three kind of core objectives that we're working towards. Um, so we want to achieve um, top 100 in the Stonewall Workplace Equality Index. 
um, we want to achieve a 75% disclosure rate across our workforce um, to measure that people feel comfortable talking about their identity at work. And we also want to see a high engagement rate, particularly um, for our LGBT plus network. And so the things that we've achieved um, over the last few years, we've developed trans and non-binary guidelines. We've done lots of visibility around lunch and learns and awareness raising. We've also been doing a lot to engage our allies, um, both within and outside the network. We've been looking at sponsorship of events externally like Pride, and then also lots of other kind of uh, charity and community work. Next slide, please. We feel like Chris Whitty on the briefings. Uh, so this is a bit of an overview of who's in our network. So we've got lots of different roles um, within the network, both from a governance point of view. So um, we've got HR involvement. We have um, treasurer secretary roles, but we also have lots of lead streams as well that are focusing on particular areas. So looking at allies engagement, as I mentioned, we've got specific roles for, for buy and trans um, a sort of awareness as well. Um, so we do events and social um, things. We have training development um, linking in and also things like mental health. We know that there are specific needs for LGBT plus people for mental health. So it's a really important thing that we do. And we've got a few of our leads trained as mental health first aiders. Um, and we also want site location leads as well to make sure that we're capturing the different needs and requirements of our workforce because we have both frontline staff, operational staff, we have call centre agents, we have people working in offices. It's a very varied workforce. And so here is just some pictures of us at Pride events, um, various Pride events at Reading and Swindon, um, and proudly fl uh, flying the Thames banner with the rainbow there. Next slide, please. So then this is a bit of a timeline of things that we've been doing. There's a lot on here, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, we have started our network really back in 2018. Before that, there were more kind of splinter groups. Uh, so we consolidated some of those groups back in 2018. That was the year we did our first Stonewall submission. Um, and then since then, we've done a lot of work to really drive visibility and awareness of our community within the workforce, uh, both for our colleagues, but also to better represent our customers' needs as well. Um, so we have changed the name of our network to be more inclusive and also to signal that we are for allies as well. We've developed the guidelines for trans and non-binary, as I mentioned before. Um, we've had lots of engagements with local um, networks and communities. And then in 2020, we smashed our Stonewall target for the year. We were hoping to reach top um, 250 and we actually got to 189. So fantastic result. Um, we want to get to top 100 next. Um, we've had really good board engagement with our exec and then we've hosted lots of virtual events, particularly during COVID, to make sure that we can reach our workforce and uh, continue to drive visibility and awareness. And the most recent thing we've done is done a lot of posts for LGBT History Month, which we're going to wrap up next week with a lunch and learn on why we have it, what it is and how people can support us. Next slide, please. You might have to click a couple of times. I think there might be some animations on here. So this is um, just some opportunities and challenges that we've had uh, over the last couple of years. So monitoring remains a big challenge. We need to make sure that people are feeling comfortable to talk about their identity and understand why we collect that information. Um, so we have an annual survey to do a cut of that. Um, and we also have a challenge around intersectionality as well. So trying to create harmony across the network with other communities. So we've done a lot of work to engage with our women's network, our faith network, our BAME network, and then multiple sites as I touched on before. And then for visibility, it's really about company branding and network visibility. So I've got this rainbow here with me today. Um, we want to do more on that. We have rainbow lanyards, have rainbow laces, but um, we want to build on that and really drive awareness. And having senior leader champions as well, like Richard, helping engage our exec. Um, for awareness, it's around training. So we do lots of great things on training. Um, but I think COVID has thrown a bit of a spanner in the works for us. It's been both good and bad. Um, so I've got a point for each. So bad, harder to drive that visibility because we can't physically be there in a location um, and staff have less time as well because they've got lots of demands on their day job. Pride events have been cancelled, so it's been challenging. However, the good is we can reach people through events like this virtually. They can be recorded and we can offer more personal support as well for those who are at home and, and want to reach out to us. They can be more anonymous rather than physically having to join us in a location at work. So thank you, that's it from me. Brilliant, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I'm now going to pass this over to Michael from Zebra. 
uh, technology. So uh, let's send across. Good afternoon. So my name is Mike Stint. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, I edit the internal audit department for Zebra Technologies, but I'm also very importantly uh, one of our co-leaders for Zeal, which is our LGBTQ inclusion network. Um, Alex, do you want to quickly introduce yourself as well? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Alex Holsworth. My pronouns are also he, him and his. Uh, so I've joined Zebra more recently. I joined as a grad back in 2019 and something I've really got involved with has been Zeal uh, since I've been here. So basically representing, I guess, it from a different different generation here. Uh, and I'm currently the communications lead who also kind of gets involved in all things events as well. So two very different kind of perspectives on Zeal, but both equally engaged and in kind of doing it all. Very good. So going into the first slide here, I think we'll, we'll talk about a few things. One, we'll introduce you to a little bit more about Zeal. Um, we'll talk and then I'm going to turn it over to Alex and he'll talk a little bit about some of our strategies and the the challenges we've had and how we've mitigated some of those challenges. Um, but before I get into that, uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about who is Zebra first or, or Zebra um, in, in, in the UK. And you know, so we're a publicly traded corporation. We're headquartered in Chicago, um, hence my accent. Um, we are global. We have global operations, um, annual revenue of about four and a half billion U.S. dollars, uh, and uh, we're in the asset intelligence tracking industry. So mobile computers, uh, scanners, uh, barcode scanners, uh, printers, software, and, and services that support that asset intelligence for for our customers. So, so who is Zeal? Well, you know, first of all, Zeal is a is the word for a herd of zebras. It's also the acronym for the Zebra Quality Alliance, um, and our mission is to very similar, I think what you heard from Tim's Water is to promote a safe, inclusive, supportive working environment so that everybody, um, LGBTQ allies, anybody at the company can, can be their authentic selves and feel comfortable being their authentic selves in the workplace. Um, we were founded in May 2019, so we're coming up on our second year anniversary here soon. Um, and we've, we've gone actually with a co-leadership model. So I'm one of two leaders for Zeal. Um, my other leader, um, Mike Underwood, uh, is is uh, a straight cisgender ally. I am a gay man um, in the LGBT organization here at Zebra, and we did that on purpose. We wanted to demonstrate that Zeal is open to anybody in the company, uh, and we want to encourage people to participate um, in various capacities uh, in the Zeal organization. Um, some of the goals, I'm not actually going to read through all of the goals that we have here, um, but I'm going to highlight a few of the ones that we've been most focused on in these first couple of years. Um, and, and what I think a lot of organizations as they start up are, are primarily focused on. For us, it's been education and awareness, um, making sure people understand why it's important to be thinking about LGBTQ inclusion, helping understand the LGBTQ community a little bit better. Um, but then secondly, being that support network for our LGBTQ employees and allies and enabling them to come forward and be their authentic selves at work. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how we've done that. Um, in the next couple slides. Um, and then I'd say the third primary response or primary goal that we've been focused on this last year is helping to connect our leadership team um, with the needs of the LGBTQ employees, uh, their allies as well, um, uh, to make sure that we're, we're, we're creating a space that we can attract and retain that top talent. Um, I would say we've been involved in all the different goals that we've had on this list, but those are the primary three that we've been most focused on over the last uh, year and a half to two years. Alex, do you want to talk to us a little bit about some of our strategies? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, as you can see on the screen here, if we were to kind of split up Zeal's kind of five main strategic kind of focuses, it would be these, so just to talk through them, uh, global reach. Uh, I'm myself based uh, in the UK. Uh, the headquarters is actually quite close to uh, Reading. Um, uh, and basically, we obviously each kind of sub region has their own LGBT focus, but we obviously want to be a collective organization all over the globe as well. Um, so that's very much a kind of big focus for us. Um, we found a really good way of doing this is having regional leads. Uh, so we call them chapter leads in each of the kind of key facilities. So each region, so uh, we've got a North American chapter lead, we've got a European chapter lead, we've got an Asian chapter lead, and they're kind of just coordinating things on a more local scale. Um, obviously, each country has a different approach to being LGBT. Some regions are more challenging than others. So just having someone local with that kind of background understanding we found is just really useful. 
there's also an opportunity as well. Um, there's so many different cultures have so many ways of different ways of looking at things, and it just really means a really good way of learning from each other. Oh, the North Americans are doing that. Oh, maybe you should try this in Europe, or this is something that's worked really well here. Uh, maybe that should be tried there. And we found that's been a really nice model so far, and it's just going to be a really nice mash of different kind of ways all working towards a common goal. Uh, in terms of visibility and connection, just really putting LGBT people on the map. Um, I think there's some surveys that probably said that lots of people weren't even aware there were LGBT people at their work and people were almost scared to kind of come out. Can I talk to people about being gay? Is this illegal? So just kind of making them, putting them on the map, letting them know it's absolutely all right to be your kind of authentic self at work. Um, and we, we do something called a monthly virtual coffee chat and this works well being global. Uh, basically once a month we just talk about an issue that's normally relevant to a topical theme. So maybe it's Black History Month, maybe it's Pride or anything in between and we found these just a really good point coming together we call them we made them quite in, engaging so there's going to be polls throughout them there's going to be uh, break off sessions and we've just found this a really really nice way we've got some really good reactions from this and we started at maybe a group of 20 people a month and now we're looking at 60 70 the one we had yesterday had close to 100 people um, and yeah, that kind of brings us on to intersectionality. We're working with the other inclusion networks uh, as well out there. Um, Zeal is just one of many. We have a women's inclusion network. We have Latinx, one for millennials and Gen Z, all sorts, just coming together and basically making Zebra as inclusive and diverse as possible and making sure this comes up to leadership as well and stuff like talent, uh, making sure the next wave of LGBT individuals uh, feel comfortable to join Zebra. Next slide, please, Toy. So yeah, obviously there are many challenges and there's obviously going to be lots of kind of hurdles along the way. Lack of awareness uh, is definitely one. Some people aren't, even, as I said, lots of people were not even aware LGBT people existed in the workplace. So therefore they wouldn't be aware of the challenges uh, that people typically face. So just really education uh, on this. Uh, obviously, if we're looking at a cultural or legal way, some countries it's not even legal to be gay yet. So it's just basically doing what we can to support this inclusion programs. Uh, if the leaderships are promoting an active kind of LGBT inclusivity, then that will kind of trickle down to the rest of the workplace. Um, it basically very much working with these sub communities, obviously Asia, uh, we found probably one of our more challenging regions. We're doing it slower. So rather than just going full frontal LGBT education, we're just starting more generally with inclusion and diversity. And then over time, kind of trying to obviously hit the kind of harder hitting LGBT issues. Uh, and then this visibility, uh, once again, just basically making LGBT as visible as possible on the map. Uh, that's, that's the reason why we're all here today in this event. And it's very much been the kind of forefront of Zill's focus. So I'll hand you back to Mike to talk through a few statistics to end the Zebra section. Thank you, Alex. So, so one of the things, if you go to the next slide here, one of the things that we've we've leveraged um, is, is statistics. And, and Alex mentioned the challenges for awareness. You know, when, when we launched this this inclusion network, you know, I did get comments to say, I don't understand why we're doing this. What is the point of this? I've never seen any discrimination against anyone who's gay or transgender at, at the company. Uh, I'm not, not really understanding the, the point of this. And you know, it's really helpful to back this up with um, statistics to understand why this is so important. And so we've leveraged things, content such as this, as part of those dialogues. Um, you know, understanding that only half of the LGBTQ workers um, are out in the workplace. Um, that's impactful. And, and what does that mean? You know, th th there's actually 30% productivity you gain um, from being your authentic self at work. So imagine the cost of that to the company of someone not being able to be their authentic selves at work. It means real real currency, real monetary currency for an organization. Um, you know, I think also helping people understand a little bit further that um, that there's that, that, that the, the, the challenges people are up against in, in the sense that, that not everybody is even knows that there are LGBTQ folks at, at the, in the workplace. Um, helping to understand that um, uh, that, that they, you know, that, there, that there's a, a large volume of, of individuals who are not comfortable talking about sexual orientation in the workplace. So helping to understand some of these statistics, we leverage these from the Human Rights Campaign or Stonewall in the UK. There's a lot of great studies out there for workplace challenges and being able to articulate that message is what's been helpful for us to elevate the conversation at Zebra. So those are some quick insights there. I'm gonna turn it over to the next uh, party here for, for the session today. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're moving on to Laura from Hampshire County Council. Uh, there we go. Hopefully that's worked. There we go. Uh, yeah, thanks to me. Um, hello, everybody. Really great to be here today. So, uh, yes, as you can see, I'm from Hampshire County Council. My name is Laura Wood. I'm the chair of the staff LGBT plus network. Um, I have a co-chair as well. His name is Jordan. And unfortunately, he's on leave this week, so he couldn't join us. So I'm going to kind of give you an overview. Um, if we could just move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so our network um, it has actually been set up for quite a few years now. And actually, I need to give a quick mention. So Camilla, who is going to be speaking to you next, who is now at the University of Southampton, was actually one of the people within our organisation who helped to start off our LGBT network. Um, but I took on the chairship roughly three years ago. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a, a flavour of how it's been since I started uh, my involvement with the network. So really what we, we had to do was kind of pump a bit more energy and reinvigorate it. One thing we found um, is that kind of it's it's a work of passion if you're leading a network so that the, the former chair had been kind of struggling to find someone to hand it over to and was kind of really feeling quite worn out by the, the kind of effort of taking it on, on on herself really so uh, myself and my previous co-chair we we really tried to kind of um, take stock of, of where we were so our main thought was around kind of making the um, the network a little bit more visible corporately. Um, what we did was we tried to figure out the policy context we were working within. Um, we were kind of really clear about what purpose we felt we had, cons consulting with the, the existing members around what they felt we should be doing, um, looking at the stakeholders that, that the network had previously been working with, any other stakeholders within the organisation that we felt we should be targeting in order to try and achieve our goals. So really, we kind of revamped the processes we used to try and get things done. We found new communication channels, enhanced other ones. Um, and then we also did a lot of work in finding allies and sponsors across the organisation. So kind of really realising that we don't have all the energy and all the power ourselves, but our strength was in the kind of numbers and the committed membership that we had um, and to try and kind of sell that to, to our um, allies as well. Um, so this slide here really just kind of gives you a little bit of an overview around the, the kind of um, successes and achievements that arose from doing that. So we managed to engage with our kind of senior officers within HR and within corporate services. Um, we started to collaborate a lot more strongly with the other networks. So some of the other groups previously have already spoken about intersectionality and, and making links with other colleagues throughout the organisation. And also that was for us a key way to kind of really ramp up the energy we were able to give to the to the network and get those economies of scale so all the networks do have similar issues in terms of engaging with staff in hard to reach locations across the county jobs that don't have easy access to it and certain issues that we can work together on to kind of pool our resources um, and so we started to do things to make the network a little bit more credible and more visible. So we, we did training sessions for middle managers. We've offered some kind of support um, on trans issues to social workers who are working directly with clients. We've kind of tried to become those kind of go to people, ask us the silly questions that you might feel uncomfortable asking. So we're kind of the kind of go to people that um, the colleagues might want to, to come and talk to. Um, so we also when we were starting to do more of this work, it became more obvious for, for members of the organisation why they might want to join the network. So that's something to try and grow the membership is really being clear about why you would want to join our network and what might be in it for you if you do join. So we have things like events that we do around LGBT History Month, Pride Month, um, Pride um, kind of events, although sadly, you know, last year we weren't able to do that, but we're kind of doing some social things, doing some corporate things to, to kind of get our membership going. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on as well um, was around doing this with a limited budget. So obviously being a local authority, there's not that much money sloshing around for some of this stuff. We don't really have a kind of a specific department that we report to. So we kind of we don't really have access to, to a very large budget. So some of the things we've done um, are around kind of working within that that kind of network of stakeholders to try and see what we can offer to someone and what they can give back to us. Things like uh, simple things like flying the trans flag here that we, we, we did. We also fly the pride flag as well. Fairly low cost to actually get the flag, but every year and we work with our colleagues um, in the facilities management who, who put the flag up. That was made possible by kind of talking to the assistant chief exec about why it's such an important thing to do and low cost, high impact. 
Um, we've also done things, so for example, we can work with HR, we've helped them, uh, consulted on some policies around guidance for managers and trans issues, uh, and they've offered us some free training. Um, and we've helped them with kind of um, looking at some of their online training, checking it from an LGBT perspective. So we kind of have quite a good close working relationship and therefore some of the members of their department are able to kind of help us with things we need. We've also been revamping our web pages and we've had people whose job it is to kind of build web pages helping us. So we really try and get the kind of membership to bring their skills and experience, which is good for us at the network, but it's also good for the members because it means they've actually got something that they can put on their skills and experience on their CV. It really helps them to kind of prove. Um, next slide, please. So this is really just a little bit about shows you perhaps like the fun side of what we've done so you can see here other things we've done um a picture on the right there is us with the other staff networks we organized a conference for the day for staff networks a couple of years ago so that was where we got kind of middle managers to come and talk to us about why inclusion helps you to be more innovative helps you to kind of achieve your goals more easily uh, we've done things like um, putting in unisex toilets in our offices. Uh, that's just some pictures of us at network meetings, talking to people at events, and also um, our kind of progress pride flag that we were very proud to, to acquire last year. So we're you know very pleased about that. Uh, I think there's one more slide as well, actually. Let's move on. Yeah, and this is just yeah a few other pictures of us kind of you know hard at work but also having fun. So which is kind of important because they're the two things for me that are, are kind of important from our organisation um, and and getting people to to come along to the network. So um, I suppose if I'm kind of giving anyone advice about how to kind of run an LGBT network, it's really about understanding your audience and your stakeholders. Figure out what they need, what can you offer them, what can they offer you, uh, and also you know don't forget to kind of have that slightly more fun and informal side as well for kind of the members of the network to, to meet each other and have fun. That's me. <laughs> really, I just wanted to make sure that that was you. Thank you so yeah. much, uh, Laura. Um, so as you mentioned, our, our next speaker um, is Camilla. So last but not least, we have Camilla um, up to speak. Hi, thank you. Um, so I haven't got any slides, so I feel a bit jealous. I should maybe have done slides because I quite fancy saying next slide, please. But it's just a bit of fun, isn't it? Um, so what I thought I would kind of bring um, to this session uh, is more around how can people in, in my kind of role, so my role when I was at Hampshire, my role also at the university is um, equality, diversity and inclusion manager. So I'd just like to say a little bit around how can um, EDNI colleagues support staff networks to grow and develop. Um, so I think there's a really close relationship between those two. Um, and it, it sometimes is it's a bit of a, a sort of bit of a dance, I suppose, so that it isn't the EDNI team or leads that dictate to the networks or direct the networks as to what they should be done because within any organization whether that's a private or public organization there is a huge amount still to do although that we have come a long long way in this country compared to many others there is still so much to be done and um, we, we all know this i'm sure um, so it would be really easy for me in my position because EDNI teams are usually woefully under-resourced to think, great, here's a network, here's a whole heap of stuff that they could do for me that will kind of get off my to-do list. Um, that kills networks, uh, that would sap the energy out of it. So I think Laura mentioned around that, um, you know, they, they kind of get driven by the passion of the people they're there. So I think um, the role of the EDNI team should be, in, and my background is in community development, I think it's important using sort of community development skills in guiding and supporting and, and kind of trying to stop those and it's always just a handful of people they're really kind of driving networks forward you'll have loads of people in the committee but the real work is usually done by three or four people and it's trying to kind of make sure that those individuals don't burn out so how do you do that um i think you do that by linking people up to the to the relevant people um so it's, it's really nice to do this kind of like 
but we I can now see you know Laura is, is still flourishing and things keep growing that you know it's really nice to kind of look back on because you think of oh, some of those little seeds that you sold over the years are, are kind of flourishing so one of the things that I have done in the various organizations I've been in where I've helped set up networks is is um introduce the chairs the vice chairs you know the key players in networks to the chief exec the the vice executive or whoever it is you know introduce them right at the top because again people in in my role usually have this kind of privileged position where you work with people at all levels of the organization so you you have got at, you have got an opportunity to open the door and that's not always possible for the folk that are driving the network so I think it should be up to your ED and I leads to open the door for you if you're not in a position where you can open that door to the folk that hold the power. So that's one of the things you could do. Um, and, and why do that? It's around because otherwise it becomes you and the ED and I team talking about the agenda. So I'm a, a straight um, woman and although that I actually the, the Hampshire network and also in Dorset County Council I ended up chairing both of the LGBT network for a while and I always felt inherently kind of a bit that's not really right but everybody in the networks well no 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 but we, you can you just chair can you chair it and in the end what happened was one of my boys was sick and I said well can you just chair it and somebody took over and then finally it actually went to somebody who could identify as LGBT and, and off it flew um, but you know, so why do it? I think do it because it is fundamentally the right thing to do. It allows people who have a much stronger and more authentic voice to truly influence and shape um, how organisations develop and grow and shine their light on things that, um, you know, organisations are curious things, aren't they? We organise ourselves in such a peculiar way where quite often some of the folk at the very top have a very limited set of frames of reference that they're coming from. Um, so by having staff networks, you, you're starting to to kind of make people a bit uncomfortable because you're shining a light on, on areas that people maybe don't really want to look at or they didn't even know they even existed. So I think that's where my role help should help uh, staff networks to well, what do you want to look at? You know, so they can work really well. They can support each other because sometimes, and certainly I've done that with networks over the years in different organisations. Is there are things that I know that needs to be done, but I can't really push at it necessarily because of a whole heap of politics and what have you. But if I could get somebody in the network to do it, and I make sure I immediately kind of catch when they kind of raise it, you know, then we can work quite well. Sorry, my core presenter wants to join me. That's a dog. Um, so yeah, I think those were the th the main things that I thought that I could kind of throw into the mix. And with the community skills, uh, community development skills, all I would say there um, to and, and, and probably doing discredit to community development, but it is it's around knowing when to step away from the kind of the limelight. It should never be around um, the EDNI team in this space. Kind of it, it's there to support. Um, Last thing I will say, I won't plug it, but I, it was in the picture earlier that Laura shown. I just want to flag this book here about the incredible power of staff networks. Um, and it is a great book. And one of the things I'm doing at the moment within the university, I bought that book for all of the chairs of the different staff networks that we have. And we are then my team working with the chairs around the content and the book, you know, so how can you use some of the things in there to to keep going because it's hard work running a staff network and it's hard work to keep it going and it's particularly hard in times like this um you know everyone's a little bit kind of fatigued with the whole virtual event stuff um but you still want to you want to have people engaged so i would recommend that book if you're kind of feeling the the slump and i always say to people that it's okay if you know, you can only just about keep the gas flame kind of on a tiny little burn. It doesn't need to be full steam all the time. Um, it's OK that it goes up and down a little bit because everyone's doing this on top of whatever it is that you've been employed to do. I'll shut up now. 
Brilliant. Thanks so much, uh, Camilla, and thank you to all our speakers. So you've heard a bit from all of our panelists now. Um, so now we're going to go into a question and answer session. So um, you can ask questions via, for those in the MS Teams live event, uh, there is a Q&A uh, function. Um, let me just share my screen so you're not just looking at looking at a blank person. Um, uh, there is a, a live Q&A um, uh, section on the side which you should be able to ask questions in or you can also use the Slido. Uh, so if you go to www.slide.do and enter in the code hashtag A900, uh, you can ask questions there. So we do already have um, a question on there already, uh, which I'll put to our panelists. Um, so what, oh, where's it just gone? Oh, it was just on my screen. Uh, what is the most impactful step you could take in engaging colleagues into an LGBT plus network? So if I ask any panelists who are willing to take that to, to raise their hand quickly. Oh, we have Alex from Zebra. Hi everyone. Uh, can anyone see me? There we go, I'm on the live bit now. Um, so I, I think making it interesting. I mean, obviously there is some really kind of hard hitting LGBT issue issues that are really sad. Um, for example, mental health is always going to be quite a prominent uh, topic in the LGBT community and it's quite a difficult thing to talk about. And maybe people who are an ally or almost scared to get involved in the uh, in the kind of LGBT organisations that we each have at organisation, you need to try and make it interesting, I, I think is the kind of key thing. Um, so, for example, the approach we took with uh, tackling the topic of mental health is we're doing it alongside some yoga and meditation. Uh, exercise is good for mental health. Therefore, come and learn a little bit about mental health and do some yoga and meditation. Make it interesting, trying to find new ways of engaging people rather than maybe just being presentations after presentations. Everyone's got Zoom fatigue or Teams fatigue at the moment. Just try and find something, different ways of doing it, but still hitting the same kind of hard hitting topics that obviously is just so important to talk about. So hopefully that answers your question. Just be, be diverse, be creative, think outside the box. Brilliant, thank you. Does anyone else want to come in? Oh, I see Jenny, there we go. And just to say, um, uh, some of our uh, speakers will be able to stay on just a bit after after three. Um, so obviously we've started late, so a couple of them will be able to stay on after three if we have lots of questions. So thank you, uh, Jenny. Yeah, so I, I totally agree with what Alex just said about making it engaging and, and interesting to join and reflecting the diversity. I think one thing I'd add to that and build on that is for us, we found really highlighting that we're open to allies as well and trying to um, kind of show that everybody has a place in this network. It's not a closed group, it's not a closed community. Actually, allies are equally important uh, to our visibility and our awareness and that we need to be allies for each other as well. You know, I'm not a trans person. I can't, um, you know, personally understand what that experience is like, but I can learn from those who can share their story with me so I can be a better ally for them. Um, and so I think it's it's about engaging allies. You know, whenever we've run visibility events, we've had lots of people come up to us and say, how can I help? I want to get involved, you know, but I don't know what I can do. And, you know, I'm not sure if I can, but am I allowed to be involved? And of course, of course, people can. It doesn't it doesn't matter whether you're out. It doesn't matter whether you are a member of the community or an ally. Um, you know, we, we were open to everyone. And I think having that embracing, inclusive um, kind of approach is what's helped to engage our workforce particularly. Brilliant, thank you so much. Does anyone else want to come in on that question? Any other thoughts or should we move on to another question? Oh, Mike, are you ready to speak? Is that a hand up ready to speak or is that you fiddling with your? Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> I think you're on mute, Mike. <laughs> Sorry that's about the that. first time we've had to say <laughs> that this go. session, so that's that's good going. <laughs> <It's> amazing. <laughs> so the couple of things I would add to that, um, you know, I think visibility is a big piece, and it's visibility from two directions. One, um, making sure your LGBTQ folks are visible, because the more they're visible, the more others are comfortable being out in the workplace as well. I mean, it was amazing when we first launched the volume of allies that joined who later realized that it's OK. It's, it's I, I can actually come out at work. It's going to be fine. So that was number one. I think the second thing I would say is around the visibility of leadership. Bring your leaders, be it the CFO or um, it could be the CEO or the head of tax um, into your sessions because that sets the tone around the importance of uh, inclusion for the organization. 
Brilliant. Thanks so much. And I think that sort of links in quite nicely with another question we have here. So how important is the buy-in and support of senior leaders in the organisation for networks? I mean, Mike, did you want to continue there or, or does someone else want to come in? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to continue there. And, and, and if just someone else has another idea, I'm, I'm, I would love some of their, their perspectives as well. But all right, we'll you know, go Mike sense, Miller. It's very important. It's, it's you know, to me, it, it's, um, it sets the tone for the overall organization on the importance of what we're trying to do. And people follow the behaviors of the leaders of the organization. So if they see somebody high up in the organization who's contributing in this way, it gives them permission to contribute as well. Um, either contribute to the activities that we're doing in the inclusion network, or to contribute to the behaviors we're looking for, for in the organization to make this a safe um, place for everyone to be their authentic selves. And then Camilla, you had your hand up. Okay. Yeah, so obviously agree with all of those points. And I would also say I think it's really important in terms of senior leaders. They can play a vital role in um, making network flourish and kind of keep them going and giving them real credibility. They can also play a role where they could do exactly the opposite. Um, so building those strong, regular relationships. And I don't really personally like the word kind of sponsorship. It's just I haven't really come up with anything that I think is better. I just find it a little bit patronizing and the whole championship and sponsorship because it it is it's around relationships and I suppose that is the better word It's around building relationships and around if I was a really right up at the top of the triangle I would want to be best kind of close friends if you will not friends but you know I want to be really close to the networks because they are seeing things and hearing things that are not reaching me because when you're at that very top you get quite filtered that the messages that get filtered um but you get a more authentic story and maybe some of the things are, are, are not packaged quite so um, sterile as they maybe get uh, when, when you normally get other messages delivered to you in kind of senior leadership positions. So I think they're really important, um, but for that to work, they need, it, there needs to be mutual trust. Um, so if it was that, you know, say, say Jenny here was um, the chair of, of um, the network within my organization and I was the like, you know, vice chancellor, I would need to know that if I showed a bit of my vulnerability or my kind of um, ignorance around certain things that she's not going to go away and go, you will never believe what that Camilla did. You know, it, it, it has to be this kind of um, mutual respect in the, the what you have got shared in common is that you want to see a better, more inclusive organisation, and that's your kind of starting point. I think too often I've so I've seen it go wrong where it's seen as the or well they're a campaigning group, they're just campaigning for things. Well, then that gets off on a, a wrong foot. So yeah, I would. Yeah, that's probably what I would add. No, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla. Um, so we've got another question here on have the panel encountered any barriers in setting up their network and how did they overcome them? Do we have any takers? It's a very broad question. <laughs> Anyone want to put your hand up? Oh, go on then, Laura. Thanks, yeah. Um, so I suppose it's maybe slightly less about setting it up, but there's definitely a thing around kind of not um, making people feel overwhelmed about the the task of being part of the network and, and participating in it. So I think, um, you know, having a, a kind of realistic uh, view on what you can achieve is quite important because um, as it's, you know, it, it is a, a kind of a work of passion and, and people who are involved are doing it because they really care deeply and it is, possible I think to get fatigued by the kind of the empathy you have and the kind of the scale of the task and the number of people you might want to help so um, I think that can be sometimes some people think oh, I really want to be involved but I can't give my entire energy to it so I therefore I, I don't think I can um, so the way that we try to overcome things like that was just to really have even the simplest of tasks so we have somebody who can help us simple things like checking our shared inbox helping us send out the kind of rainbow lanyards you know things that could it only takes you 15 minutes a week you know i think it's important to be able to break the stuff you're doing down 
Um, otherwise, it is, is quite easy, I think, to feel hugely overwhelmed. And, and again, for us, that was why it was really great to link with the other networks within our organisation as well. So the BME network, the disability network, uh, the kind of carers and working parents network, because we, we share energy with each other. Some days it does feel difficult and we share that with each other. And some days people have had really great successes. So I think that's that's quite important because it is really all around the energy you've got personally to, to keep it going. No, that's that's brilliant. Thanks very much. I mean, did anyone else want to come in on that question? Um, and Mark, I see you there. Hi, yeah. Hi, thanks, Tommy. Um, so I think um, at Thames, we I think Jenny mentioned earlier that we sort of had our corporate kind of networks were sort of been running for about three years now. But prior to that, pretty about probably two or three years prior to that, we did have kind of more sort of separate localised groups. So we tried to do things more locally, um, where on the one hand, you can get kind of more kind of specific engagement with teams. Um, but on the other hand, it's kind of very um, fractured and um, sort of detached. And so you have different kind of um, support across the company. So for us, I think the key thing was making sure that it was corporate um and trying to bring those things together so that was just an additional point i wanted to add there really is kind of look at how you can do it across the whole piece rather than sort of locally so yeah thank you brilliant thanks mark um so uh there is another question around how how organizations have supported people to be involved in the staff networks i think laura brought up it does take a lot of time and it can be sort of a lot on someone so there is a question there and camilla you've got your hand up yeah, so I think uh, one of the things I've done in a three different places I worked is set up a formal agreement um, with the very top of HR around a similar like your trade unions kind of agreement that people who are involved with staff networks get a, a nominal amount. You can't precisely kind of count it out like hours and minutes, but that there is something where it's recognised that this stuff doesn't happen without people putting in some work. Um, so have something that actually people are protected some time to achieve some of this work and also work with HR that this actually becomes part of people's appraisals, uh, personal development plans, whatever it is that is called in the different organisations. Because what I have seen far too often is that they, we've got great passionate people and lords on this call who are doing this work over and above they're already kind of full time job and they're probably equally passionate about that job too. Uh, you know, so they're working themselves tirelessly into the bone. Now, none of us mind doing a little bit extra when we can see that it benefits. But, you know, it gets a point where organisations then become a bit abusive. So I think that's where you need to use people like me and your organisation in striking up some sort of agreement. And most organisations like the university where I am now, we're about, you know, we're saying we want to embed this into the organisation and it's everybody's business well then we need to get it recognized as in everybody's business so get it into your personal development plans and if your manager is persistent to that involve your EDNI manager to kind of get that actually properly recognized and um, you know get get a bit of reward for it if that is possible within your organization also talk to those individuals around can there be just a tiny bit of money you don't need a huge amount lots of things can be done very very cheaply or more creative ways but you do need a little bit of money for if it is that it's lanyards or whatever it is but yeah i think you could do that get it recognized and that's where it's important to have that relationship with the senior managers because they'll get that they know that nothing comes you know you don't get anything for free so recognize it look after your people and does anyone else want to to add anything to that not seeing any hands so we'll take one last question then because well there is only one more question that i have here but um the the question is how have you as networks encouraged people to be their authentic selves in the workplace you know what is the the first step do you think to create a safe space that people feel uh, confident to be them themselves. I see Jenny. Thanks, Tommy. Yeah, I would say um, one major thing that we've heard a lot from people within the community is 
the importance of seeing role models and other people that f that are comfortable being out and talking about it because then they realise that it would be safe for them too. Um, so we have someone within our network who's recently been on a journey um, transitioning um, and she has spoken very openly about her experience and said it's so important for her to be able to share that because when she was growing up and when she first joined the company she didn't see anybody like her who'd been through that experience and talked about it and you know we must have multiple trans people within our organization we've got 6,000 employees there must be you know a significant number of people who are um, trans or non-binary um, however in the, in the past we haven't really had anyone that's been a visible person and, and out in that way so um, I think she recognized that because she felt comfortable to talk about her own experience that she could be a um, a visible presence within the network and within the company to then help and um, encourage other people to feel safe as well. Um, and I think since then we've had quite a few people who felt able to come and talk to us and approach her and ask about her experience um, in confidence. But the fact that people are now starting to feel that they can do that because they're seeing examples of where other people have, have sort of led the way. Um, and equally for, for Mark and myself as you know chairs of the network, we're open about our identities too and sharing that uh, and again people feel comfortable to come and talk to us and ask about our experiences um, it then helps other people feel they can do the same. Brilliant thank you very much um, Jenny. Does anyone else want to add to that? I see Alex there we go. So yeah, I, I think I mentioned uh, earlier on in this session that we have the virtual coffee chat uh, here at Zebra where basically we just send a uh, one hour a month where we all just come and talk about an LGBT issue. Uh, one thing that we really try and do is make these absolutely as interactive as possible. And I feel if it's a bit of a one way dialogue where, say, it was myself or Mike or anyone else in the team just presenting information at people, then you're maybe not going to get the most authentic reaction from them. But when we have like breakout sessions, uh, we encourage people to kind of interrupt us in the in the thing uh, with their like personal experiences, and then the kind of the, the session you, you kind of have almost the slides as a starting point uh, to start the discussion, and then just from there people keep coming with their stories. You suddenly realise that a colleague's going through a very similar problem to you, uh, or someone was maybe LGBT they didn't realise, or the allies are a lot more vocal about their support than maybe you originally thought. And I just feel that interactivity really really makes everyone be a lot more authentic. And from there I'm just loads of kind of nice internal kind of colleague relationships have developed so just keeping it as interactive lots of touch points for people to come and open up and I think it's a nice contrast from the kind of normal day-to-day -day life just having this kind of safe space uh, to come and basically be the authentic selves so that'd be my answer. Brilliant Alex thank you so much and then Richard I see your hand up there so I'll let you come in. Hi Tommy. Um, yeah, I was just going to sort of um, give a perspective from a senior sponsor um, um, at Thames. So I think what you mentioned there, Alex and and Jenny, is uh, very much on the how do you get people together, how do you get people talking to each other, how do you get people comfortable in the workplace. Um, but m my role is obviously to make the to make it at my level and a more senior level understand what that means, um, to support people, to make sure that there's no um, discrimination. That there's no uh, um, um, that there is positive support and positive support for people like Jenny and Mark and the rest of the network so they get recognized as part of their annual appraisal process for the work they do um, so um, and, and I do spend time with with my peers um, when when there's people want to come and join the network and, and take up a role is to say actually how important it is to the network and how important their uh, their, their, their time is to us and, and and you know and hopefully that that does help it helps helps get the message out helps to um uh professionalize the network helps to make people think of it as a, as a really positive thing in our organization rather than you know a, a small bit that's that, that that doesn't get sort of a um in the um in the press and we've had quite a few reports in the in the sort of monthly magazine and articles and uh, online so we've, we've done quite well in terms of our comms team engaging as well. And I think that's part of the overall process as well, getting your comms team engaged in some bigger organisations. Brilliant, thank you so much. So um, I think we're going to call the session to the end there, unless any of the panellists have anything urgent they want to say. Um, nope. So uh, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of our uh, panellists who have joined us today and shared some really 
uh, interesting and really thought provoking insights into what they do to help support uh, staff networks and their organizations, LGBT plus staff networks and their organizations. And I think there's a lot of uh, learning that can be taken from those um, to us in the NHS. So I really appreciate your, your time and coming along. So thank you. Um, also, uh, thanks to uh, Nick and Christine who have been helping me behind the scenes. Uh, so just sort of thank you to them as well. Um, so there is uh, an evaluation link, which I think my colleague Nick will um, put in a, a space accessible for you to, to fill in. So I'd appreciate people taking the time to fill in the evaluation link. Um, I expect a lot of feedback about difficulties joining. That's uh, fully expected. Um, but um, the, this session has been recorded and we will share out the recording. So anyone who had difficulties joining or missed any part of it, um, they should be able to get the full session via the recording. Um, and yeah, I can only apologize for, for the difficulties that we started off with. But uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining us today. Um, and uh, I wish you all well, thank you, goodbye. <laughs>